some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello and welcome back to the channel, everybody. In today's video, we find ourselves in Michigan with the Sovtard Milton Hensley as he was put on trial for a road rage incident involving a firearm. And, uh, well, he ended up trying to escape justice and uh, was brought back for his uh, sentencing phase. But he is totally clueless and he thinks that the trial is still going on and he certainly acts like a complete moron. So let's go ahead and sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Call the case of People v. Milton Hensley, case number 23S 18766 FH. Defendant is present via Zoom from our jail. Uh, he is in Coper, uh, I believe. So. Le who? The her. Oh, a pro per, okay. So in other words, you went pro se, and, uh, well, that, uh, well, really explains why you lost the case if you, uh, used all that sovereign sis and mumbo jumbo garbage in the court. Too bad we weren't able to see it because it wasn't exactly put on YouTube. All right, Mr. Hensley, how are you today? Objection, I'm a leak, babe. All right, so Mr. Hensley. Seriously, dude? You do realize the time for objections is long since past, right? We've been through this before. I'm going to call you by the name that's found on the information here. You have my nationality information. You have my. So, Mr. Hensley, are you representing yourself today? I'm a persona so yours. All right. Are you representing yourself today, sir? Propio persona so juris. Gee, no wonder you lost spouting off random Latin phrases like that instead of legal jargon, actual legal jargon. It's no wonder that uh, you completely fell flat on your face and ended up being convicted. Oh, man. Uh, how about a uh, nice little brain transplant to help you out just in case you need a new one for prison? Because, well, dude... Uh, yeah, I don't think that the uh, uh, Latin will work for you in there. All right, so Mr. Hensley, I'm not certain what you mean by that phrase. All I'd like to know is that whether you're representing yourself today or not, we've had this conversation many times previously. It's up to you, sir. All right, so Mr. Hensley, you don't, you don't have a response for the court? Well, you don't know what probable son so Jewish is? That's me and somebody representing and presenting themselves. All right. So is that not what you want to do is to represent to yourself way. today? I'm presenting myself, Islam. Yes. Okay. And then as we've talked about several times, you understand that representing yourself can put you at a disadvantage to other folks like the people who have attorneys that are representing them. Do you understand that? No, I do not. Okay. What don't you understand about that? None of it. You don't understand any of it? I don't understand how the disadvantage. You don't understand what? Did you say the disadvantage? Yes. How the disadvantage? In what, what, in what term? In what manner? So the disadvantage not, would be not, that they're familiar with the rules of court, that they're trained lawyers and the rules of evidence and things of that nature, things that we've discussed many many times so we talking about law we talking about codes and your parents have any children that live sir yes sir how about they regret that we're talking about statutes we're talking about court rules we're talking about case authority what you about understand law? that you could be at a disadvantage i understand law are we are we discussing right. law or the, the i'm statute? not gonna play this game Hey, Deputy, okay, I want to well, run over here in person. Low, we'll put this all on the record. Statue. Hey, you lead paint huffing moron. Uh, you do realize that even according to Black's Law Dictionary, the book that you guys worship, uh, statutes are 
pretty much laws. I mean, if you really think about this thing or really actually studied anything at all, besides useless Latin phrases that are not exactly used in courtrooms anyway, I mean, you probably would have been able to understand this. We're going to put this on the record in person. We're going to get Mr. Hensley sentenced today, and we'll make a complete record as complete as we can. But I want to do that in person because we can do this all morning via Zoom, and it's just not very conducive to that. So if he can be brought over, and then we'll continue with our doctor until we see him here. What do we have next that we can do? Yes, sure. sir, thank you. The case will be Lowell Schwartz, case number 24S. So the judge put the idiot at the end of the docket. So about two hours later, we come back to him. So let's roll that beautiful bean footage, shall we? Three hours later. Can you move it along? I'm all out of time cards. Case number 23S18766FH, people be Milton Hensley Bay Jr. Defendant is present. He is um, in person. Um, he is in pro per. Today's the temperature for sentencing. And in front of him in the podium, I've provided two copies of his right to ability. All right. So, Mr. Hensley, we are back this morning for Sugar Court sentencing. He's appearing in person. We did try to start this earlier with him remote at the jail. It just made more sense for the court to have him present where we're not trying to talk through Zoom. So, Mr. Hensley, here we are again today, sir. First, I want to start with this. When I arraigned you a couple of weeks ago, you were given the opportunity to request court appointed counsel, and you were also given the opportunity for the last several months to retain your own counsel. Are you representing yourself today, sir? To objection. For the record, make the record reflect. My application is Malik. Title is B. Works American National. I'm the Islam. Well, Lodi freaking God! Anything else? Proper persona, so jurist. All right. So, sir, the information that I have in front of me. As your listed name is Milton Joseph Hensley Jr. So you've been through this before. Respectfully, I'm going to call you by the name that is listed in the information, Mr. Hensley. So, Mr. Hensley, do you wish to proceed by representing yourself today, sir? Over well, my Fifth Amendment right. All right. You don't wish to answer any questions from the court? Really, dude? Uh... Pleading the fifth on uh, whether or not you want to represent yourself. Uh, dude, that's to prevent you from incriminating yourself. This is just a matter of representation, you freaking moron. Jeez, where did you leave your brain at? I mean, come on now, dude. Please let us know. I really want to know where it's at so to see if it's uh, doing okay without you. All right. So you're not going to answer the court when I'm asking, do you wish to proceed representing yourself today for circuit court sentencing? Do you wish to do that, Mr. Hensley? Objection. My appellation is Malik. Title is me. All right. So then let's get this on the record. Um, as far as the PSI, Ms. Bond, um, it would appear that the court has a copy of this. Mr. Butler apparently has it. And then what do you know about Mr. Hensley receiving this copy? Uh, that he was emailed a copy. And it's my understanding one was picked up at the office by someone. All right. So, Mr. Hensley, have you had a chance to review the pre-sentence report, sir? Objection. My appellation is Malik. Title is B. And for the record, you have my nationality information within your files. So you know my appellation. All right. So when was our PSI completed, Ms. Bond? Looks like 229 of 04. Yes. Cut it, reviewed it. 
And so after the review, that would have went out to all the parties for some time in March. Okay. Um, just while I'm pulling this up, um, the, it appears that there would have to be an addition in jail credits okay. um, as he was arrested on the um, But for it, there's an additional 12 days from 4 to 18 and 24 to today. So we can make that correction and, and update the jail credit. The PSIs were sent out on 229 today. So I also want the record to reflect I've seen Mr. Hensley several times as it relates to sentencing. He had been appearing for all of his court appearances. He had been cooperating with the court as it relates to expressing his desire to represent himself in these proceedings. He's never wavered from that, which is why the court is inquiring again today. I recognize that sentencing is an important part of the circuit court process. It's uh, certainly a, uh, a hearing, if you will, that would require an entitle, I should say, the defendant to the assistance of an attorney, which is why I'm asking. However, the court is balancing that with the idea that this circuit court sentencing date has been delayed several, several, several times and the court can't help but glean at this point, it just appears to be a delay tactic. The court, we sift that back through the dates, has given Mr. Hensley several times to hire counsel, express that interest. Again, it appears in hindsight that it's simply a delay tactic. The court has given Mr. Hensley several times, uh, actually not even with the sentence that the court's required to give here in a moment, um, keeping him out on bond to do those things, explore counsel. Even after being arrested on the warrant when he failed to appear, the court also gave him the opportunity again to request court appointed counsel. In fact, the public defender's office appeared at his arraignment. Mr. Hensley Bays had the ability to fill out the affidavit and request counsel. Here this morning, in response to the court's questioning, he does not appear interested in answering the court's questioning. Again, it appears to be a delay tactic. I am comfortable that the pre-sentence report has been provided months ago to Mr. Hensley. I am comfortable Mr. Hensley has given, been given ample opportunity either to retain counsel, to ask a court appointed counsel, and therefore, the court's going to proceed with sentencing today. I can't continue to allow this delay of the matter uh, in what appears to simply be a, at this point, series of uh, uh, incidents and responses or lack thereof of responses simply to delay the matter. I know Mr. Hensley's been engaged with this. We have several filings that are not court filings that he has continued to uh, send to the clerk's office, um, some of which he has referenced, none of which have anything to do with the case and or the court's requirement to get him sentenced now that he has uh, been convicted several months ago. So in other words, yeah, definitely a delaying tactic. Uh, but you know what? Time ran out for him, and now it's time to pay the piper, dude. Yeah, you should have, uh, yeah, just accepted it and, uh, did your time and moved on with your life. But that's not how you, uh, solve tards operate. You don't uh, accept responsibility for your own actions. You want to delay, you want to throw temper tantrums and everything like that because, uh, Life doesn't work the way you want it to. But guess what, Softheart? Life isn't fair. So deal with it. Of these crimes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with then Mr. Butler. As it relates to the PSI, are you aware of any corrections, additions, 
or deletions that need to be made with it other than what we've already placed on the record with probation. Uh, I would just um, ask the court to take a look at Fence Variable 4 um, regarding psychological injury to a victim. Um, we did receive a victim impact statement. It looks like well, from this point forward, the judge is going to be reading a uh, victim statement. And, uh, well, this Sovtard is going to get a bit more vocal uh, about his situation. So it's going to get a bit more interesting from this point on. So let's carry on, shall we? It came from Robert uh, Siegel, um, who was the male occupant of the vehicle. In this case, the victim. Uh, we received that just this morning about, uh, about two hours ago. Uh, so I can read that. I do believe it references um, facts that validate scoring for a week before. All right. So why don't you read that? Okay. Oh, this is from Rob Rob Siegel. That's S I E G E L. He says, "I do have things to say to the judge and the proceedings that I would like to be read during the sentencing below." Your Honor, I apologize for not being here in person today, but I could not find the time again to keep seeing this through. The amount of stress and anxiety Mr. Hensley has caused my family is downright disgusting and infuriating. Pull a gun on a family driving down the highway for nothing more than getting out of his way, fast, not getting out of his way fast enough is obscene. My daughter, who was only nine years old at the time with special needs, was terrified and it took months for her to feel comfortable riding in any vehicle again because she was scared someone was going to cut her life short for seemingly no reason at all. My wife had to start and is still in therapy over this whole situation, which has thankfully, which has thankfully helped her anxiety levels to become manageable, but also is not covered under our insurance. So it's cost us quite a large sum of money and that brings with it its own stresses to our family and social life. I find myself driving and cannot seem to relax because anyone I see speeding up behind us reminds me of the terrible people in the world and just how ignorant someone can be with, dis with disregard for others' lives, including those of its own family and child in the car. Being that there has been that there are previous charges against Mr. Hensley for almost the exact same situation where he brandishes a gun and threatens to kill people because of his unchecked aggression and inability to safely operate a vehicle, which then turns to road rage, I plead that the court recognize this man as a danger to society through blatant disregard for human life will eventually cause someone to lose theirs, if not his own. Because of all the pain, sufferings, financial burdens, and overall creation of trauma and issues in the many lives he's affected, I petition that the court give Mr. Hensley the maximum sentence possible for his crimes, so that my family and others he's affected may know some semblance of peace. To Mr. Hensley, despite everything you've done to my family over this very long process, and the disdain I have for you as a human being, I hope that you, your time behind bars will allow you to see life differently and that you can truly find the air of your ways to become better for yourself and your family. Okay, then. Uh, so we've got this standard uh, Sovtard uh, issue of no victim, no crime. So they go out speeding and causing all sorts of havoc like this sorry SOB did. And he ended up creating victims out of his, well, no victim, no crime uh, fallacy right there. Uh, so how's that? how that work out for you, dude? No victim, no crime. Uh, well, dude, uh, that mindset right there has absolutely no empathy attached to it whatsoever. Putting yourself into other people's shoes, in other words. So, because of that attitude you had right there, you're standing here about to be sentenced for, well, this crime right here. You are an idiot. So with that statement, um, I think we have two individuals that are reported by um, Mr. Stagel to have suffered emotionally from this. His nine-year-old daughter and his wife both of them were in the car time. I think that would validate more than 10 points. I object to that. Hold on. So, Mr. Hensley, what is your objection? Tell him prove everything he's saying. Wow. Wow. Just wow, dude. You have no concept of how a trial works, do you? You are currently in the sentencing phase of this trial, which means you've been convicted, which means they proved to a jury 
of your peers beyond a reasonable doubt that you were guilty of this crime. So, dude, get a freaking clue. If his wife and everybody went through the trial, show me the doctor did the report that he went through it. Because right. I can't believe somebody that was slamming brakes on the interstate at 75, 80 miles per hour to deal with trauma. You could have killed us and everything behind me. Ain't no such thing as you got trauma for you slamming your brakes. All right. Prove with prove the accusation that you made. Prove it. All right. So, sir, I am going to grant the script like you're coming from a movie or something. I am going to grant the request for score in OB4 based on the uh, victim impact statement here it does appear to meet the definition. Now, OB4, for the record, psychological injury to a victim could be scored 10 points if the serious psychological injury may require professional treatment. And in making the determination, the fact that the treatment has not been sought is not conclusive. First, we have the issue of the nine year old in the car, apparently with special needs, and dad victim as expressed in that statement that was just read into the record, how this is still affecting uh, the minor child. And that makes sense in court as it relates to somebody that's nine years old and was observing somebody pull up next to them and point a handgun at them. Uh, at them. Still having been put in for the record. Mr. Hensley, you've been convicted of that, sir, oh, by oh, the court. We're going to have a lot okay. of we will have all so Please let me finish, and then yeah, I yeah, certainly continue. will give you the opportunity to address the court before sentencing. And then also, pursuant to the statement that was just read into the record from the wife, who also was in the car, according to the testimony at the trial, she is not only suffering from the effects of this, has sought treatment and continues to seek treatment, which is in line with the OV scoring guidelines that professional treatment may be required, in fact, has been and is still being engaged. So we'll score 10 points for OB4. So that will change our total OBs to 35. And does that change the level? That's right, it changes it to a level four. And so a C4 cell is going to be 523. So basically, dude, this was all brought up in your trial. Uh, question, uh, where were you at? Were you even paying attention? Were you, uh, at least trying to formulate a defense or were you, uh, sitting there at the bench, uh, just, uh, wondering, huh, I don't know what you were thinking at the time, dude. I can't possibly, uh, jump into the mind of a soft heart, especially one whose head is so filled with lead paint chips that he can't even figure out that uh, he's in a sentencing phase of a trial. All right. Any other additions, corrections, or deletions from the people? Uh, no, nothing from, uh, from the people, and the, I don't know nothing else from the people. So you've read the statement into the record then, nothing else from victims? That's correct, Your Honor. And then anything on behalf of then the people? Your Honor, um, the recommendation on the 0 to 17 guide, uh, guideline range is 12 months on count one and two and two years on count three preceding the count two sentence. Um, the people did initially support that, um, but with the change in the sentencing guideline range, obviously this does open up your honor to more opportunity um, for incarceration if you so choose, and we would leave that discretion. But otherwise, we ask that you at least follow the recommendation as you do intend to. I intend to. All right, so Mr. Hensley, I'm going to give you the opportunity before I ask you to address the court for sentencing. Do you have any additions, corrections, or deletions as it relates to the pre sentence report? Yeah, any additions, corrections, or deletions? All those accusations are false, and none of them have been proven. Okay. Not one. And a uh, dumbass, uh, this is not the closing arguments of the trial. This is the sentencing hearing. You've already been found guilty. This argument is null and void at this point. But if you feel like you've been wronged in some way and that you shouldn't have been convicted, you can always appeal. And, uh, well, you can see where it goes from there. But, yeah, good luck with that, dude. I ain't talking with this, this, this story. 
as it relates to this report? Do you have any additions, have no corrections, or deletions? Excuse me. No, I don't have a report. All right. Uh huh. So, as it relates to sentencing, is there anything that you want to state to the court before a sentence is imposed? You know, I have my medical information. You know, I have stage three cancer. You know, I have head trauma. You know, I have neck and back injury. I suffer with a dry foot. Anything else then, Mr. All right. So Mr. Hensley has provided, it is accurate, information regarding different uh, medical issues that he has, that he is suffering, and is suffering today, as a matter of fact. However, as the court sat through this trial, it's clear to the court that what Mr. Hensley was engaged in is troubling. The testimony of these victims where they were traveling on westbound I-96, minding their own business, when Mr. Hensley's vehicle comes up behind them at a high rate of speed, the victim described with great clarity how close Mr. Hensley and his vehicle were to them to the point they were extremely uncomfortable. Did not, hold on, Mr. Hensley, let the court finish. Okay, to the point that uh, they thought they were going to be struck. The victim, I recall, describing un being unable to even see the front of Mr. Hensley's vehicle. That's how close it was, meaning the grill, headlights, I recall the testimony. And that they immediately got over. The victim then went on to describe that Mr. Hensley pulled up next to them and pointed a handgun in this manner. Of course, pointing over to the right and directly at these individuals. The victim described how he reached back, sort of to shield uh, his family and that they were getting down as best they could. Now, all of that, I think, is certainly um, actions that would cause the victims here to feel their life was in danger if somebody points a gun at them. The fact that somebody is tailgating that closely behind them uh, on the highway at speeds of 70, 75, 80 certainly puts people in danger, could cause people to be incredibly uncomfortable about what's going to happen next. But it's a long way, Mr. Hensley, of course, saying having sat through the trial, you create the situation by driving in a manner that makes these folks uncomfortable by coming up on them at a high rate of speed and following it now that closely. Objection, man. Objection, man. Mr. Hensley. I drive a BMW. To anybody to. with an autopilot vehicle, you know for a fact it won't do that. Right. That's a so, fact. So Mr. Hensley. Not what he giving you on out of his mouth. A fact. <laughs> an automobile will not get up on nobody. Automatically okay. jam brakes. I told the you trial, BMW does that. The trial is over. You oh, have the opportunity. Not it's not to cross examine those witnesses. I did that and you deleted everything I said. Now, yeah, court made and you some heard rulings. everything that they said was a lot. So now you, and you, you know it was a lot. Let the court finish. All right. So the testimony was as the court has described. And there is no doubt that all of those actions Mr. Hensley is responsible for. <laughs> That's the ironic part of it. He creates the situation that causes discomfort for these drivers, and then he's the individual that introduces a gun to the situation. Court heard 404B evidence that was remarkably similar where Mr. Hensley is right on the bumper of a young lady, the Grand Rapids, Kent County area. And then when she is very uncomfortable and pulls over and stops, Mr. Hensley again introduces a gun, pointing it at that individual. Now I mentioned this because I'm not using that uh, as it relates to a sentencing issue, I'm using that and that it's clear Mr. Hensley drives in a manner that endangers other people, that causes them to report his activity to other people. And then when they attempt to avoid, evade, if you will, what his, Mr. Hensley has caused, then he introduces a gun to the situation. Now, Mr. Hensley, I don't have to tell you that it's Fairly obvious that in today's world, right, today's world of shall issue CPLs, that even if you believe that somehow you're justified in 
and displaying a weapon. And for the record, there's nothing in this trial, nothing this court heard with the 404B evidence or the incident at hand here that we're sentencing you on that would suggest that in any way, shape, or form that you were not responsible, that you had any legal justification to introduce the weapon to it. But even assuming in your own mind that you were, what happens with that in today's world is they would have a very easy avenue to articulate, I felt in fear for my life or great bodily harm. And assuming they were lawfully carrying a gun, could take action, shoot you, in other words. And I can remember just in little Ione County, an incident that occurred just a few blocks from here in which an individual was tailgating a lawful CPL holder going right down Steel Street over here. And so that individual, much like here, got over, pulled into the car wash to get away from this guy. And the guy behind him pulled right in behind him, much like in the 404B evidence I heard with you. And so what happens is the CPL holder what is this guy doing? He's crazy. He pulls his gun. Now, you can argue whether he could articulate at that time whether he felt his life was in uh, danger of uh, death or great body harm. But regardless, so what happens is the CP, the uh, tailgater, he then also was a valid CPL holder and he pulls his gun. And guess what they did? They shot each other and they both died. The ironic thing is maybe it's the one time, the one time that a government program worked 100% because to get a balanced CPL, you have to take this course, do all those things. And part of that is shooting your gun 15 times or something. I can't remember. I worked um, on home call. I knew about CPL. Yeah, well, well, my point is, so they both hit their mark and they're dead. And it's started from something just like this. And so my point in demonstrating the story to you, retelling the story is when you engage in this kind of behavior, it puts your own life at risk. Put your own life at risk. And that you are lucky that hasn't occurred to you, but you certainly have frightened the heck out of people with what I heard in this trial. You certainly were in the wrong, and you're not a valid CPL holder. That's the other problem. Because I don't need it. All right. Well, I recognize you think that you have some fundamental rights that I'm not aware of found either in state or federal constitution. And you certainly can take those up on review, right? I'm really in uh, Western District Court already. So that's fine. Okay. You can appeal anything oh, that you'd love, yeah. any reason you think you have a valid appeal. But they're simply not found in state or federal constitution. And so here we are today. So that's how we end up with a carrying a concealed weapon, felonious assault, felony firearm. And what the okay, court likes to do, yeah. Mr. Hensley, is I'm reviewing this. I will say this, I'm weighing positively in a, in a positive manner here. You stand before the court at age 50, you don't have any prior criminal history. Exactly. Which is somewhat remarkable when I heard about the 404B evidence. So exactly. I don't know how that didn't result in some sort of crime, but it didn't. And I'm recognizing that, and I'm gonna recognize that in the sentence I'm going to impose here in a minute. We do have the sentencing guideline now, now, which is five to 23 months. Court likes to think about the middle. The middle of five to 23 is going to be 14. And I also want to recognize that you don't have any prior criminal history. And that I will also recognize until lately that you've been cooperative with the court. You showed up to court, that you, uh, as far as I could tell, did your very best to represent yourself and uh, were adamant about doing so and took this matter seriously. All of those things, I think, are things the court can weigh that are positive to you. The negative, though, sir, is the outcome of this is your actions and one causing this and then making it worse with introducing the gun and pointing it at this family on the date in question. Can they prove that? They did prove that. No, they yeah, I'm a reasonable doubt no, at trial. I Come on now, dude. Uh, yeah, it's already been proven. The trial's over with. I mean, come on. Uh, haven't you figured it out by now, you smooth brain soft art? I recognize you disagree with that. Because you, you had, had asked the court to decide it. You had the court to decide it. You had somebody mouth. Those are all yes. evidentiary issues that you, again, can explore on appellate review, sir. You're welcome to do that. Yes. All right. So as it relates to the car carrying a 
concealed weapon. All right, so carrying the concealed weapon is count or charge number one. Court's going to impose a sentence of 12 months to five years. That's under the minimum guideline range of, or the middle, I should say, of what the court was looking at at 14 months. So it'd be one year to five years with the Michigan Department of Corrections, and you do have credit now for 14 days that you have previously served. As it relates to the uh, felonious assault, now this would be charge number two, the court's gonna impose a sentence of one year with the Michigan Department of Corrections to the statutory max of four years. You will receive credit for 14 days that you have previously served. And then as it relates to count three, this is the felony firearm. The court is required, Mr. Hensley, to impose a sentence of two years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. And then counts one and two that I mentioned earlier will be served concurrently with each other. But this count three by statute is required to be served consecutive with and proceeding these other two counts. So two years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. As it relates to the monetary obligations, Mr. Hensley, the court is required by statute to impose $130 as a crime victim rights assessment. Court's going to impose court costs in the amount of $1,500. There'll be a $60 DNA testing fee, and then required by statute are the state costs in the amount of $68 on count one, $68 on two, and $68 on three. All right, so Mr. Anzi, you do have a right, and this is something you're interested in. You've expressed that interest to seek appellate review of the sentence the court has imposed. If you'd like to do that, you have 21 days from today's date to make that request. You have the appellate paperwork there. Ready for him along with the pen. All right. You so, ready in the district court. You want the case now? So hold on. So you have 21 days from today's date to make that request. All right. If you want to ask for a court appointed attorney as it relates to this appellate review, you have a broader window of 42 days to make that request. Okay. Because you were convicted at trial, you have an automatic right to seek this review, meaning that if you ask for that review, then the appellate court will have to take a look at it. All right. So if you can, then there's a pen there. I need you to sign. There's two copies of that one for you to keep, the other one for you to initial and date that you've received it. So if you could do that for me, sir, it's right there on the podium. You can take that with you, I'm not signing anything. All right, so for the record, Mr. Hensley Bay is indicating you don't want to sign that, sir? I'm not signing anything. All right, so for the record then, though, I am gonna send back with the deputy his copy of the appellate uh, review form. I'm going to place the unsigned appellate review form here. Mr. Hensley, only because we've dealt uh, with this case for so long, if you want to explore these, though, this form is important to you, okay? I recognize that you are refusing to sign it or acknowledge it for the record, but this is something that you want to file timely if you want appellate review of this. They don't okay? have jurisdiction. So they don't have jurisdiction, neither do you. All right. Well, I think that the court has jurisdiction. We don't see and it. if you want this reviewed by a Michigan court, then you need to file that. But I'm uh, Dude, uh, the issue of jurisdiction would have been taken care of in the pre-trial hearings and everything like that. So, dude, you're so freaking far behind and very much irrelevant by now, dude. I mean, it's already been taken care of. But, yeah, that's besides the point. Now you've got to do your appeals and everything like that, and you're going to be sort of being at least two years behind bars because of your stupidity. Congratulations, dude. 
you are a moron. So at any rate, guys, I hope you uh, enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next one. Dude, so there's no way I can get in, bro? Come on, I'll put you on my YouTube. But shut up, Wesley. You gotta put signs up, ma'am, if it's- Are you Glenn Serio? Who's that?